two, one, you're on the air. Good morning, Las Vegas. It's where I am with Zandra Pollard. Today our topic is, is racism a mental illness? Um, today my guests are Felicia Morell, Keith Stark, Michael Franklin, and Monique McCoy. So I was having a conversation with a girlfriend of mine for many years, and she knew about the show, It's Where I Am, and she posed uh, a topic. And that topic was, or is, is racism a mental illness? And um, that there's a huge discussion in the black um, community with, with the professionals in um, mental wellness. Um, if racism should be in the DSM-6. So- Zandra, just a heads up, when they start talking, I need you to get off speakerphone, because I got too much air. So uh, I have Felicia Morell on the line. Felicia, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Felicia. So I was telling everyone that you are a good longtime friend of mine, and you brought this issue up. And uh, we want to know your thoughts on, is racism a mental illness? And should it be in the DSM-6? I absolutely think that, um, well, first of all, I want to start by thanking you for allowing me. Yeah. yeah, so just make sure you're not on speakerphone and you're good. To share my opinion. Um, it all started from a simple question that I gave off to my group a group that I'm a part of, clinicians of color, and um, should racism be included in the next DSM-6 in some form? And it lit up, and most of the people were saying no, and but they didn't really have any valid reason as to why it is a no. So some people were saying that um, it's an excuse and um, it will become an excuse for um, racism. And I absolutely disagree with that thought simply based upon other um, disorders that we work with, like pit um, sexual predators, killers, gamblers, drug addicts. We don't excuse their behavior. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we are not lawyers or judges. We are supposed to treat our clients. And by no way am I saying that we're going to show up at KKK rallies and doing outreach. No, that's not how we would come about, you know, these clients. These clients would come in based upon some sort of conflict that they're having with their racist behavior. And so, so they, they would come we, in and they would treat. So my question is, is that, so then they would have to know that they are having an issue with racism? Is that what you're saying? Well, um, yes, absolutely. I mean, sometimes people have these conflicted uh, and internal uh, issues with themselves because it becomes, you know, like I was watching the Best of Enemies, the Taraji P. Henson, and what happened in that is, you know, Taraji P. Henson was um, a black outreach worker, and she wanted, um, and the school burned down, and they had to come together uh, the KK leader, the AK leader, and the George um, B. Henson. Um, her character. Uh, yeah. Her character. I, yes. Yes. They had to come together and create change in their community. And by way of doing that, this KKK member, he became um, conflicted in his beliefs. And so those type of people would come into the office um, be before. I mean, for their conflict. Okay, so and what if someone doesn't know they have a problem? What if there's a racist who's been a racist for 25, 35, 65 years, and they don't believe that they need help? So stay on the line, Felicia. I want to get another perspective of someone who agrees with you in some capacity. Keith Stark, can you tell us uh, your thoughts? You know, I think racial, you know, when it comes to racial trauma, um, it's experienced on both sides, I believe. Right. I think not to give um, racist an excuse to be racist, uh, but when you when you look at those pictures of hangings of people who were hung, uh, you know, and there were kids in that in that picture. There's kids in that picture smiling, thumbs up, 
uh, eating sandwiches, right. having picnics. Right. Um, I think they, they do, they also experience some form of trauma when it comes to racism. And so, um, you know, I don't know if we'd like to say it or we like to, or like to think it, but racial trauma uh, is on both sides. And so as they grow up and as you teach your children, um, then it becomes an issue. So through trauma, I think, yes, the DSM um, should um, have a component in there that focuses on um, on racial behaviors. Uh, Felicia, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, according to the Western Jewish Journal of Medicine, 30 years ago, uh, black psychiatrists thought to have extreme bigotry classified as a mental disorder. Um, they did not feel at that time that that was something that they wanted to do in the DSM. But it just goes to show you that this um, issue has been going on for very long. And yeah, I think that is something that should be looked, looked upon. And I don't know what capacity it would be in the DSM, but I think that it would be important to look at it to be a part of the DSM in some form. Of, some form. Well, from what, what I understand is when you brought the subject up to me, I thought it was extremely interesting because in my mind, I just thought maybe we can get some races committed with a 50-51, you know, some type of involuntary <laughs> commitment, you know. But, um, yeah, 72-hour hold and get, you know, help them to understand right. that there's something wrong with that thinking. Mm -hmm. But I want to thank you, Felicia, for calling in. I love you. You're one of my best friends. I love you. And good luck to you in the future. Also, thank before you, you go, do, would you like to give out your uh, contact information for anyone in the California area who may need your services? Absolutely. I can be reached at Felicia L. Morell at yahoo.com. Thank feel you. free to look at me, look at me there. And you know, your information will be on my website as well. You can go to itswhereiam.com and Felicia's bio and pic picture will be posted there by Friday. You'll be able to click on to It's Where I Am and it will direct you straight to the YouTube channel to see this uh, discussion. So thank you, Felicia. All righty, thank you, Gondra. I love you much. Okay, take care. So let's continue. Thank you. So let's continue the conversation. So I'd like to hear from you, uh, Michael. Um, would you like to expand on your uh, perspective? At least from my perspective, uh, I believe we should be looking at uh, racism as being a uh, in the DSM as a uh, traumatic event. It's being it, it should be looked at uh, in the same like as uh, the microaggressions that happen when you're constantly exposed to trauma you are constantly dealing with a traumatic event. So if I'm on an elevator and somebody grabs their purse, if I'm in, on a bus and somebody decides not to sit next to me, or if I hear, you know what, you're different than the rest. Those are microaggressions. Those are part of the traumatic events that happen constantly. I'm looking at it from the point of being a victim, not the victimizer. I think the victims are the ones that, that are suffering from a mental health issue and not the victimizer. The victimizers are learn, taught, but then again, as a victim, you're not you're not put in a position where you're taught to be hurt. You're not put in a position where you're taught to be disrespected. So the victims are the ones that should be looked at uh, with this uh, from a DSM level uh, with uh, traumatic events. That's where I stand. Thank you. And so now we have Monique who has uh, a different take. And can you please share your feelings? Absolutely. I think. One, we have to start with, we have to decide if we're talking about racism or we're talking about racial trauma because they are not interchangeable and they are not the same thing. I am not an advocate for putting mm -hmm. racism in the DSM-5 because I believe racism is a learned behavior. Okay. It is something that you can control. It is something that you can change if you choose to. Now, racial trauma is something completely different. And as my colleague here was explaining, racial trauma is constant exposures to racism, constant exposures to microaggressions, right? That build up over time. And we found, research has found that has similar symptomology to PTSD. So I would advocate for that to be a section of PTSD. Sure. But racism, I would absolutely not advocate to be in the DSM-5 because you can change that. 
you can wake up one day and say, you know what, I might have learned to be like this through my childhood, mm -hmm. but I no longer believe those things and I no longer want to conform to those norms. So it's like what, it's like what Felicia was saying that uh, they would then look to seek help from a professional, um, but then I could see more of the person who has been the victim looking for some help you know, um, not really the person who is the racist. Yes. Um, I don't see them searching out any help unless they go through something traumatic themselves to give them a, a wake up call, right? Yes. So, uh, Keith, let's go back to you. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, people who are victims of racism, examples of being victims of racism? I know you posted on uh, my website a certain image and several, uh, there's several other images that we know of. Can you tell us more? Uh, yeah, so, you know, we, we've been experiencing this since we've been in this country, right? right. It's nothing new. Um, and I think um, our counterparts also know, you know, like, like, like my colleague was saying, uh, Monique, like, they know that they're being racist. They know that they're being hateful. Um, and so they, in them continuing to do it, it's just a, a, a way to be superior and oppressive. Right. And so, so in that, um, um, we get to experience that racial trauma, unfortunately. And so it, it goes all the way back to slavery, like my sister said, and, and, and it hurts, you know. And we're so desensitized right. to it because right. we've seen it growing up as a kid. We've seen these images. We've had stories, discussions with our family members about things that they've you, encountered. You know, one, one thing, one post that I, uh, you know, I continue to see is, um, from, from um, fellow black people saying, you know, how many of you can have had a gun drawn on you as, as a teenager by a cop, right? right? And so most people say, I have, at what age? 12, 15, 16, 21. And so we've all, and if we go around this room, we probably can all say, yep, me too. Yes. You know, and I had a basketball in my hand dribbling when I had a gun pulled on me by, by a police officer. And so when you talk to our white counterparts, they, they think that this doesn't exist. Like, no, right. I don't, that's not a problem. You know, the, 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 the white folks that I went to high school with, like Keith, when we were in school, we didn't have those experiences. Right. Sure we did, but you weren't there, right? Exactly. No, nobody, no white cop pulled a gun on you because you were black in the neighborhood. You've never experienced this. And so it created a trauma within myself and within us as a community that, um, you know, it's very difficult to, to overcome. So I agree, I think we're all three are saying the same thing, that racial trauma definitely needs to be um, in, the, in the DSM. So what, okay, so if it's in the DSM, then what about other cultures? What about the other cultures like uh, Indians, mm -hmm. uh, Asians, mm -hmm. um, Hispanics? There's still an issue with skin color, mm -hmm. right? The lighter, the better, the darker, the worse. Um, what if there's racism within your own community? All right, and even with us, if you're experiencing racism within your own community, would that still apply? Well, I think, again, I think that's, that's learned behavior, right? We're learning to do what, what has been done to us. So within our own communities, we mimic that, that racial tension. So I think that's a part of our racial trauma. Uh, you know, uh, having this 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 divide or creating this divide um, between us within our culture. So I think that's an effect. That's a that that's also a part of our racial trauma. So you would then agree, um, Michael, that it would still apply to any culture. It, it, it would it would apply, but the, but again, uh, it's just like Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. We're focused on Black Lives right now. You know, uh, the first thing to come up out of somebody's mouth is All Lives Matter. Again, a microaggression. I don't exist. Only all lives matter. So within the DSM, would it have to be specific to black and white then? I, I, would, I would say specific to African Americans who are dealing with it. I say that. I say specifically for, for those who are, again, 1619, slavery, dealing with, again, reparations, dealing with all these things that come up from us having uh, to work free labor, from us having to deal with redlining, from us having to deal with uh, not being able to get in a, our, our grandparents, not being able to build wealth. That's generational. That's issues that, again, other cultures don't deal with as much as we do. Um, we are taking phone calls if anyone wants to join the discussion. The caller line is 
647-3688. Uh, the topic is, is racism a mental illness? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and oppose that one though because as a mental health professional, we don't get to decide who we treat and, and you know, I'm only gonna treat this group of people, right? So if we're asking or we're advocating for the DSM to include something like this in it, it has to be all encompassing. We can't say it's only for black people. I agree 100% that yeah, we're focused on black lives right now mm -hmm. and absolutely this is a, a very specific black issue, mm -hmm. however, our experiences aren't necessarily unique as minorities, right? Like Hispanics, they go through a lot. We just had these kids locked up in cages, right? You know, the microaggressions that Asian communities are experiencing right now with the coronavirus, you know? And so we're not saying that ours are important, but if we're talking about the mental health community and us being mental health professionals, we don't get to discriminate who gets treated for things. So it has to be, if it's gonna be in the DSM, it has to be for everybody. The DSM, we all know, is not gonna say, oh, this is only specific to black people. It'll never get in there. You know, so it's one of those situations where, like, I, I get where you're coming from, but we gotta choose our battles, because they're definitely not gonna put it in there exclusively for black people. Again, uh, we, uh, the, the issue is we need to have individuals who are on the DSM board who's going to create the DSM as well. We don't have representation there. But the heart, I, I kind of, right. it's, it's an argument, I'm kind of arguing with you about that because as a mental health therapist, I kind of can pick and choose my clients. I kind of can say, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not okay with a, a female rape victim. I, I'm, I'm not specializing in that. So I kind of can pick and choose my clients, just like we can pick and choose, you know, how we deal with our clients and how we assess our clients as well. Uh, right now, we know uh, that our country is going through something. African American individuals is going through something. Mm -hmm. African Americans have been going through something since we, we set foot on this link. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody, we, we, we sit back and we watch everybody else. Maybe maybe the tide has changed. We don't focus on African Americans now. Now we have a president who's focused on Latinos. Uh, at one point we had a president who focused on Native Americans. But we have always been the victim throughout. Whoever was focused on it, it was always African Americans that were victims. Agree, okay. but I'm saying like as an individual professional, yes, you can pick and choose what your practice is. Like my specialty is kids. So if a 50 year old man walks through my door, I'm like, no, you know, this isn't my lane. And absolutely, but as a community, we don't get to decipher who gets treatment and who's not. So in terms of a DSM creation of this diagnosis, it would have to be all encompassing. Yeah, well, and, and then as the, and when you look at the DSM, you look at different... Um, oh, I'm sorry to cut you off. For those who may not know, can you please explain what the DSM is? I should have did that earlier. Yeah, yeah so the DSM is pretty much a, a, a therapeutic Bible, right? Like it, it tells all of, uh, all of the, the diagnosis from, you know, all of our disorders, um, the characteristics of the disorders. And so when one is dealing with um, something, you know, we... We try, as therapists, you sit in a room and you sit, you, you you know, you're listening to this. But then when you go back to your study, you go through your DSM to find out what diagnosis they may or may not have. Okay, thank you. And just to interject, anytime yeah. you go do any type of assessment Ooh. anywhere, they're going to use that DSM right. to form a formal diagnosis. So yeah. it'll have symptomology, it'll have prevalence, how long you've had these symptoms, and based yeah. on all these criteria, mm -hmm. then it'll say, based on the information you gave me, we think you have this diagnosis. Okay. okay. And so in the DSM, you know, uh, different uh, symptoms and diagnosis is broken down based on, and so if you have a certain amount of characteristics of this, of a diagnosis, then you can fall right in line with that. And so I think when it comes to racial trauma, you know, yes, we all experience it, experiences it, but, but it's different for African Americans, right? Yes. Like we're talking about 400 years of slavery plus, you know, uh, up until now of what we're dealing with. And so, you know, through the civil rights era, and so I think it's very unique when it comes to how racism plays a part in society for us. So I think the characteristics would be a little different and you could fall under, you know, maybe um, racial disorder, um, plus something, something, something. You know, you know what I'm saying? Well, like so, a friend of mine was saying, um, I want to give a shout out to Stu Kosh. He was saying, you could do it like personality disorder or schizophrenia right. with racist so speech. And, 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 and that's how you look at it as a PTSD, it's post traumatic stress disorder with racial issues. And, and that would be for the victim. Yes, that would be for the victim, not the victimizer. Okay? Right. Yes.
Awesome. Yeah, I, I like it. So, uh, can I ask her a question? Of course. So, could so if you're let's say you have a you know a a, a, a white student who in school gets jumped or is racially targeted um, uh, by African American students, right? So a white and, kid going to an all black yeah, school. Yeah, yeah, get bullied. And then right. So what right. happens? Right. Um, where would he fall? Would he fall under that racial trauma? And, 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 and going back to my colleague who said keeping it general, yeah, it'll be, yeah. a, it'll be a, a racial issue. Yeah. But again, uh, I still feel that uh, it should be catered towards African Americans because black lives do matter. Yeah. Right. But okay, so say that happened, right? Mm -hmm. And then that white person went to get therapy. I think they get probably through the therapeutic process a lot faster maybe than someone who's African American yeah. or what do you think? But I think, again, I think we also have to, and unfortunately, sometimes we have to to separate ourselves, right? Because yeah. as a mental health professional, mm -hmm. right, it is my job to help whatever population I'm working with, right? And so if that student comes into my office and needs help, I still have to pay attention and, and give empathy to their experience. I might not understand their particular experience and I may not have ever experienced what they are going to individually, uh -huh. but as a mental health professional, I still have to empathize with that, no matter what, mm -hmm. right? And so I think we also have to still remember at the end of the day, that is our job as mental health professionals, just think, like I would with an African-American kid, sure. right? I have to I have to be similar in that role. And, and I'm assuming you're saying that we have to also, see, and this is such a touchy subject for us, because we've all, you know, experienced. If, if you're a black therapist, You've experienced this trauma, right? Absolutely. This you're not a trauma. therapist if right. you're black. Right. Right. You're right. You're black this right. trauma. But I'm saying in, in the therapeutic room, it's important that we are mindful of our implicit biases Absolutely. so that we don't, um, you know, re traumatize or, or cause issues for our, for our clients. So I understand what you're saying. When we come in, we have to give them, um, uh, you know, their goals must be in the forefront, not our goals. Right. And that goes back to what Felicia was saying, you have to take the judgment out of it. Yeah, yeah. We, we can't do any harm, period, yeah. right? Like our job is to heal. So we can't go in there, again, with our own implicit bias, like, oh, well, you're white, so you can't have problems or you can't be struggling because that's not fair. Right. And be honest to our clients about that as well. Yeah. Uh, again, that's the blessing of having a private practice. Yeah. <laughs> I, get, I get to, you know, pick and choose my clients. I get to let clients know, hey, uh, you know what, what's great? Uh, I know I have a colleague that could probably work with you a little bit better than I can. Sure, referral. Yeah. And, and I know sometimes working in a school district, you don't have that option. <laughs> you don't. Well, we also, I mean, you have some autonomy there, right? Because we can choose what schools we work at. You know, we don't have to necessarily work to a particular school if you don't want to. You know, we were just talking about earlier how important representation is and kids having professionals that look like them, that they can relate to. I think there's a huge difference when, you know, an African-American works in a predominantly African-American school, right? The kids feel more comfortable. They feel safer. And they can say, you know what? I know you know what I go through. So let's have these conversations that maybe I couldn't have with your counterparts. Exactly. So that's absolutely right. So you guys, let me, I hear some feedback, some uh, feedback in the background. I don't know if someone's driving or Felicia didn't hang up or what that noise is, but just to let you know, I hear it. Um, so you guys, let us. Uh, you sound faded in the back. I sound faded. I got a phone call. If you want to take a phone call. Yeah, let's let's take a phone call. Hello, it's where I am. This is Zandra Polar. Can I help you? Hello, caller. Are you there? Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Good morning. Is racism a mental illness? Would it? Say it again. I was listening to, the, to what y'all was talking about. Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. What are your thoughts? Oh, okay. My, my, I don't really have a question. What, what, I, what I'm saying is, I just my opinion on that whole subject was, I don't think that uh, racism is, is is a mental issue. Uh, racism is a taught habit forming thing. It's something that's taught. They teach their kids to be racist. And black people, we far behind because we don't teach our kids to be racist, okay? 
Uh, I don't think that's true for all white people. I don't think that's true for all black people. But I do think that that situation, as far as being racism, has nothing to do with your mental stability. It's got a lot to do with what you're taught as you're growing up and what you see as you're growing up. That's just my opinion. So, but what about those who are victimized by racism? That's not taught, or that's not learned in the home. That's an experience. So if you victimize, if you victimize by racism, of course you don't have a mental stigma or whatever, but I'm talking about what we're going through as far as black people, as far as Mexicans, as far as Chinese or Asians or Indians, what we're going through, all those different, all those dis different racisms are taught. <laughs> I see, I mean, I'm 59, I just got to mind, my mama ain't never told me to hate white people. Yes. Well, they Thank, thank you so much for calling in and give us, giving us your opinion. We really appreciate it. Well, thank, that's my opinion. I appreciate you guys letting me share it. Thank, okay, thank you so much, sir. So I can see you. What, what do you have to say, Michael? Uh, and, and again, I, I, I push the victim being, being, being the person that's right. suffering from the mental health disorder. Uh, the victimizer, well, again, we all agree that it's tough. Uh, something that's taught can also be something that's learned can also be unlearned. Uh, the victim is a person that wakes up, get out of bed, and deals with the it and, and, and becomes victimized from something that they have no control in. So the victim is an issue for me. So in the black community, there's already the stigma of someone having a mental health issue. So <laughs> would that help or hurt if, if you dare include someone experiencing racism as trauma as a mental illness. First, I want to say congratulations. It's June 1st. It's Minority Mental Health Month, uh, which we did mention. A minute and a half. A minute and <laughs> but, a half left. But again, uh, there's a stigma when it comes to mental health, and, and we need to get rid of that as well. The, the stigma that's associated with mental health. Uh, uh, we probably uh, deal with uh, one out of five people in the United States of America has a mental health illness. And again, that one out of five is not just color. It's not just uh, a, a certain uh, uh, area, a certain uh, socioeconomic income. It's one out of five Americans. So. Well, I don't believe there's any such thing as uh, normalcy. I think everybody has a little cuckoo. Well, I think we yeah. also have to, as a community, I mean, even separate from the racial trauma conversations, we need to keep having conversations about mental health. I guess that's the only way people are gonna get comfortable with it and more familiar with it. You know, yes. I think we need to continue to be in spaces where we're explaining to people what treatment looks like. We're explaining to people how normal it is to have some of these disorders. It's okay to have anxiety. It's okay to have depression. This is how we can help. Exactly. This is what cope, coping mechanisms are. And you're not are. the only one that feels that way. Exactly. We all share the same feelings one at some point or time. <laughs> to you, know, it. You, yes. you know what I hate? I'm sorry. I hate the fact that we put illness on like that. Yeah. That word is in there because right. because it's, for everybody it's not an illness, and that word is such taboo that it makes it feel like it's something wrong well, with me. When it's like you said, it's a normal thing. Yeah. Right. Coming up in thirty seconds. Well, everyone, real quickly, can you please give your um, social media sites yeah. and information? So Instagram, Keith the Therapist, or uh, on Facebook, Keith Stark Therapy, and you can reach me through my Facebook, my Facebook and all that, all my stuff is connected, so. Uh, Michael John Franklin, Consultation and Counseling Associates, 702-255-0056. Uh, Monique Asha Nicole McCoy on Facebook, my name is Long, or you can find me on Instagram, Monique Asha Nicole. And for Felicia, it's Felicia Morrell at yahoo.com. All this information will be on my site, you can go to it's where I am .com. Thank you for tuning in and be well. Hello. Thank you. <laughs>